Good afternoon, everyone. I am Jeff McKay uh, from BrightScreen. Today, we're going to talk about understanding privacy compliance for opticians in Alberta. On the screen right now, you can see Rohit Joshi. He is the co-founder and CEO of BrightSquid. Um, Rohit is a lawyer who's been working in privacy regulations and technology for, I usually say, a few decades, and it's kind of accurate, but I don't want to give away Rohit's age. Um, and, <laughs> That's, uh, you know, one, one That's privacy. That's <laughs> private information. <laughs> private. Private information, and we'll we'll cover that soon. Um, so, you know, one of the reasons why Rohit, you you, you founded Bright Squid, and um, feel free to chime in here a little bit, but um, was to help protect information and and help improve the ability that healthcare providers and patients have to communicate securely and more efficiently and effectively. Um, so, Bright Squid SecureMail, which is our sort of secure communication service that we offer, um, was built with privacy compliance first. Um, with us also is Ingrid Rice. Um, Ingrid is the leading privacy expert in, in Alberta, um, and, and likely, I would say, probably one of them in Canada. Uh, Ingrid's been working in privacy for over 30 years. I can safely say that because it's on her LinkedIn page. Uh, she, she was the head of chief privacy officer for the Alberta Physician Office System Program, or POP, for 13 years, helping um, get all the medical clinics in the province up to speed in privacy. Uh, Ingrid herself has written, I think you've probably lost count by now, Ingrid, but uh, we'll say thousands of privacy impact assessments for clinics and organizations throughout Alberta and Canada and beyond. Um, as a team on Bright, the Bright Good Privacy Team, um, so we have an actual team of privacy advisors that work with clinics to help maintain privacy compliance, uh, establish privacy compliance, and do analysis on a regular basis to make sure everything's compliant as well as consult on any questions that pop up. As a team, we've written over 2,000 PAAs. We've trained, I think actually it's closer to 3,000 healthcare professionals now, but we're being conservative <laughs> here. And um, and our team is accredited. We, we do ongoing um, privacy training to, to make sure that we're up to date on, on what's happening and what's changing in the world of privacy. Uh, the agenda we're gonna go through today, we're gonna go through a legislation review. What do the rules say for you as a custodian um, in healthcare in Alberta? Um, we'll look at what compliance means. We'll talk about the privacy principles, sort of the guiding principles when you're going through your duties on a day-to-day -day basis. How do you consider privacy in your workflow? Um, we'll talk about whom does the HIA or the Health Information Act apply to. That's the main legislation in Alberta. And we'll talk about compliance as an affiliate. Um, and, and we'll talk more about what that means a little bit later on. Most opticians in Alberta, based on how you work, would fall under the, the title of affiliate. Uh, we'll look at what a privacy impact assessment is, why it's important. We'll talk about privacy breaches, which is really kind of why we're all here to make sure that we understand them, where they come from, and how to avoid them is, is the big issue today. We'll look at cyber threats in healthcare, what you need to know to help avoid sort of that evolving um, landscape of cyber threats. And we'll talk about clinic safeguards. So what are some of the things that you can and should be doing or your clinic can and should be doing to make sure that patient information is protected? Uh, so with that, I'm gonna hand things over to Rohit and Ingrid um, for the legislation review. That sounds good. Hey, Jeff, I'm wondering if you can take this slide because what I'd like to do is just to make sure that Ingrid is, uh, her video's working. Uh, we had a bit of a technical issue this morning. So um, if you just give me a minute, uh, if you take this slide, I'll I'll jump off screen and make sure Ingrid is uh, working, and then um, and then we'll pick it up from there. Well, this is one of my favorite slides, so I'm happy to. Um, yeah. So what we see here, um, you know, privacy is a whole new world. When people start looking at privacy compliance, you know, we call it alphabet soup. There's a whole lot of acronyms to learn. There's a whole bunch of things um, that people often think of as common sense, but, but privacy feels like common sense sometimes when you get to know it, but, but there's a whole lot of things to it that aren't. Um, you know, we talk about the HIA, we talk about PIAs, um, what's a custodian, what's affiliate, uh, what is the personal information protection act, what does this mean for your business? Um, you know, different regulations have different implications based on uh, how you're operating, uh, provincially, federally, um, all that kind of stuff. So we're going to go through a lot of stuff and help you frame this in your mind around how it impacts. And it looks like, Ingrid, are you ready to go here? So
I'm not, there we go. Now we got your audio coming through. I got this, but my audio has okay. to be here. I can't That's figure fine. out this one. Okay, I think we're good though. Can Jeff, yeah, are we good? We're good. Okay, I'll be oh, back. You I'll... mean audio's on this? Yeah, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> working. You're coming, you're coming through. Okay, so um, with that, um, Ingrid, if you want to cover um, the slide about what is health information. Yeah, perfect. It's my favorite subject, as we already all knew. So health information, of course, is diagnostic treatment and care information. That was a given. But it's also registration information. So one is kind of helpful, but with them together is what makes health information. So, for example, you know, uh, mental or physical information about an individual, obviously that's that's health information, but it does not become actual health information until you have a person's name to it. So the key to that is, of course, the marriage of diagnostic treatment and care with an individual. So I've got bad examples, but I've got safe examples. So it could be like uh, Rachel Notley. I shouldn't pick on politicians, but it's too late. Rachel Notley and let's say maternity clinic. Now, Rachel Notley alone is nothing. But as soon as you match it with something like a maternity clinic, obviously you have health information. And obviously that's impossible. Well, I shouldn't say that, but. <laughs> well, you know, uh, Ingrid, one of, the, one of those things that, um, that, that that's important is I know that when we've been teaching dentists, um, you know, part of the discussion is, well, it's just someone's tooth, you know, is that really private? Well, the law doesn't specify whether it's a prescription, um, whether it's a, 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 a tooth, as long as it's got that uh, elements of specific care information, including eyeglasses, including all of that, and that individual's basic demographic information, it's now protected. The law doesn't differentiate. And I think that becomes, a, it's it's of specific value for us to point that out um, because I know that there's a lot of misunderstanding around that. Yeah, you're absolutely right. All right, um, Jeff, are you moving the slides? I could move them, but I have enough trouble with technology, so better not go there. <laughs> you want to take this one, Ingrid? Yeah, for sure, because it's, again, my favorite subject. Uh, when it comes to privacy, what isn't? <laughs> it's a short list. So the Health Information Act, and that's the reason we're all gathered here today, kind of like a wedding, but not as exciting. Um, so the Health Information Act came into force and effect in 2001, but opticians were added not till 2011. And that was because at the initial onset, um, and neck care was one of the driving forces or WellNet at the time to bring in people or to bring in custodians. And what happened then is of course, they, um, they realized that they wanted to make sure that people accessing the provincial uh, systems were actually protected from a privacy point of view. And that sort of started this whole, um, I would call it a circus, but of course it's nicer than that. This started this whole PIA process to demonstrate that we are all compliant prior to hooking to an asset. So the P Health Information Act, of course, covers diagnostic treatment and care as we discussed. And then of course, health services provider information. So as opticians, of course, you are providers or associated with providers. So it also protects that information from just being used willy nilly. And then, of course, registration information. Uh, that is all combined and under the Health Information Act. It also, of course, governs and regulates, guess what? Collection, use, and disclosure, which we'll get into, into a little more, uh, get to a little more in depth. But uh, the collection, use, and disclosure is the underpinnings of all legislations. And of course, under the Health Information Act, collection, use, and disclosure is of health information. And then, of course, your privacy and security of health information and safeguards, as well as allowing assist, uh, you can access healthcare information for the purposes that you're allowed to. So it's the accessing and sharing of health information within the system to those that you are or should be sharing with to ensure that we don't have, um, you know, gaps in service. And of course, that continuity of care is critical. Um. You know, there's there's a couple of things that, that are unique about the Health Information Act in Alberta, and, and it's certainly a, a made in Alberta discussion. 
um, in, in, in Alberta, uh, rightly or wrongly, I think, uh, Ingrid, you, uh, I think you'll agree, we've got the most stringent of requirements from a privacy perspective across the country. And part yeah. of that has to do with the definition of the requirements here. So the definition of a custodian says that they have an ethical and professional obligation, which we understand. It's also a le legal obligation to protect that privacy of the patient information. The reason this starts to become even more interesting as we'll delve into today is once, even with technology, if you're installing new technology in your clinic, you are responsible for the privacy of that vendor. Now, there's ways that we mitigate that risk from a, for, to make sure that you know, you're not bearing all of the obligation around anything that they're doing wrong. However, it's an important element of the Health Information Act is that the clinic is taking responsibility for that uh, uh, security and privacy of the patient information. And you know, we'll spend the next, I don't know, 85 minutes or 80 minutes talking about what that means. Do I hear 75? <laughs> 75 minutes, 45 minutes. It's a Sunday afternoon. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Ingrid, can you tell us a little bit about PIPA and PIPA? Yeah, so um, there's a bit of a misconception because PIPA is nationwide. So across Canada, uh, PEPIDA is pretty much the legislation, and PEPIDA, by the way, is Personal Information Protection of Electronic Documents Act. And yes, it's a mouthful. But the bottom line in Alberta is we're governed by PIPA because we've got a substantially similar or stronger law than PEPIDA, and therefore PIPA takes precedence in Alberta. Um, what it means, though, to us is don't forget that as opticians, we're a small business or, or a large business. We're a business nonetheless. So that is mandated by PIPA. And PIPA is our private sector privacy law, which says all your personal information in the care and control of you as a business has to be protected under PIPA. And that includes mandatory breach notification. And that includes information that is stored outside Canada must be told to the people that are affected. So let's say you keep your human resource files in, um, in Phoenix, because it's nice and warm there right about now. But let's say you keep your information all in Phoenix. You must notify your employees that you are actually storing their personal information outside the province in, a, in another country. So it's very important that those things are adhered to in PIPA. And of course, as a business, that's highly likely, or that could be likely. And then PEPIDA, of course, um, governs all the information that's sent outside of our province. And it is, since it's substantially similar, as I said, to PIPA, we always default to PIPA first, PEPIDA second. That was easy breezy cover, girl. Now you all know about PIPA and PEPIDA. <laughs> so the HIA applies to three audiences, uh, and we'll, we'll be going into each one of these in some detail. So the first is the custodian. And and, and and it's a misnomer to think that the custodian is uh, is uh, one category of professional versus another. It's usually the person that operates the clinic or is the lead in that clinic. We also have affiliates, and we'll go into some of those definitions of what an affiliate is. And then finally, the information manager. So let's go to the next slide, uh, uh, Jeff. So custodians are um, those individuals that are specifically named in the Health Information Act. So if you go to the Health Information Act, all of these professions are specifically named. I think, Ingrid, and you and I have talked about this, I think there's gonna be an update to this list because you'll see, for example, that there are no mental health professionals. And clearly that you know is a missing element of this. Um, but for now, here's who we have. And of course, opticians are, are a named custodian. Yeah, and I definitely agree that there has to be an update coming because physiotherapists are not in there. Yeah. Psychologists, maybe they just missed some piece. I don't know, but they either they ran out of room. They ran out of room. That's a true story. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think I think we'll see an update for that, but that's almost besides the point because we know that opticians um, are covered. Now, in that in the clinic where uh, where you've got a custodian, which every clinic has a custodian. These are the responsibilities, and, it, and, and again, these are kind of onerous. Um, and so for each uh, custodian, and these are legislated, the first is 
that they have to maintain a record of administrative, technical, and physical safeguards. And we'll be talking a whole lot more about those later on. Um, just to give you a sampling of what administrative, technical, and physical safeguards are. Uh, second is if there is a, someone in the clinic that has breached privacy or has attempted to breach privacy, there has to be sanctions that are imposed. Again, this is a really interesting one. You don't often see legislation where the custodian of the clinic has to create sanctions for his staff. But this is, again, something that's been legislated. Affiliates, um, that all of the affiliates in the clinic are aware of and adhere to a safeguard. So, so there's two elements of that. The first is aware of. So people have to be trained. And second is there has to be some level of checking so that they adhere to all of those safeguards. So both of those things, there's training and checking that is responsibility to the custodian. Uh, agreements, um, written agreements with third parties, we'll talk about those. For example, uh, one of them would be your um, uh, medical record system or wherever you're keeping uh, the information, that has to be a written agreement. Um, periodically assess and review the safeguards and there must be a privacy officer within the clinic. And what's really interesting in things even like sanctions is we recently had a situation where a clinic had two employees that were, I don't want to say snooping, but they accessed inappropriately some records. I think and they were snooping. Only, well, I'm trying to be polite because it hasn't been adjudicated yet. But oh, as right. a result, it was the actual custodian that got penalized and was told, what sanctions did you specifically, did you terminate them? Did you give them a warning? what did you say you would do if someone did breach and yeah. again a lot of people just haven't covered that off and and yet it's part of the legislation so yes. there is a huge list for custodians to be responsible for if it's the same case i'm thinking about uh, we might be talking about it later ingrid but but part of that same case was were the people trained on the policies of the clinic i think it might be the same one in any it case that also language. came up you're correct yeah. So they hit almost every one of the, the six that you pointed out. Yeah, completely. Yeah. Uh, okay, next slide. Ingrid, do you want to take affiliates? Yeah, so affiliates is guess what? Everybody. That's the bottom line. So um, if you're a custodian, so you're an optometrist, an optician, whatever that is, the lead, you are a custodian. But if you're employed by another custodian, then guess what? An optician that works in an optometrist's office would therefore be an affiliate. Um, the minute you walk into, let's say, Alberta Health Services into any hospital, you automatically become an affiliate, assuming you're there as a, a work to work, not as a patient, obviously. And then things like staff employed or contracted by a custodian, again, they are an affiliate. So that's what I meant by almost everyone else. Volunteers or students at, at uh, your office, they become an affiliate. And of course, all the information managers, all your EMR vendors, your IT, everybody like that also fits under the obligation of affiliate. And I think we say it next, but the bottom line is the onus is the same, just a little lighter responsibilities, but. <laughs> so things like lead custodians in the end will be responsible for keeping that information protection protected, right? But that does not release your onus as an affiliate because everybody has a responsibility to protect health information. So um, that's why we say we're affiliates are equally responsible. Oh, look, and it says the same thing and have the same onus. <laughs> oh dear, nothing like reading ahead. Um, and there's some good things to know. If an OIPC finds that a breach was committed by an affiliate maliciously, now the affiliate will get penalized. But if you as a custodian, let's say, have done your due diligence, you have your proper agreements in place, you've provided training, then obviously you will, um, you know, you will not have to pay the same price, let's say, as the affiliate. However, you know, they will ask you all those questions. Did you do this? Did all six of the items that we have listed will be, you will be investigated on. And then of course, if the lead custodian hasn't trained, which we've seen, or um, then guess what? It's it's the same thing. The lead custodian will be the first one to bear the the blame. I hate to use that word, but that's a true story. Do we want to go next, or you want to stay on this one? Because I could talk for hours. 
So here's some, here's some examples of breaches uh, that affiliates have had. And again, there's two elements of sanctions or there's two elements of concern here. Um, first is, um, you know, uh, for example, uh, some examples of the nurses employed in a hospital looking up the records of a patient that aren't in their care. Now, nurses in the hospital are an affiliate and they looked up records. And so then the first question that's asked was, were they trained not to look up records? Um, because that is part of their policies um, that they would have agreed to is that they, they respect the confidentiality of patient records and will not look them up. So this all sort of flows back to the custodian, but, the, uh, but ultimately in, in, a, in many of the cases, it was the nurse that was held responsible and liable for, 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 uh, for you know, taking um, action that they just should not have. Um, Ingrid, I know you've got specific ones around these nurses. It's just it's I I know I was just itching to speak, and then I thought, okay, don't interrupt, don't interrupt. <laughs> but <laughs> what ended up happening is that is correct. So initially, um, AHS had a fair amount of of incidents where nurses were actually looking up information. Now the nurses were all <laughs> they may have gotten together and discussed it, but either which way, they said, whoa, 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 nobody said we couldn't do that. Now, I thought it was common sense, but the truth came down to AHS, as the custodian on record, was then mandated to train all the staff. And that's now why you see all this training in place. So now the nurses, or not just nurses, but anyone else working in a hospital, they can't because they know that they've now all been trained. So again, training becomes a very important aspect. And then, you know, the, the, the secondary element of that you know, making it more relevant um, would be opticians that are employed by an optometrist um, looking at patient information that, that they don't actually need to have in order to fulfill their duties. Um, you may have access to net care as an optician. Um, you may have access to other records uh, for that patient uh, as an optician. And, and, and if, if those uh, patients are not your patients, but if you have no need, no need to know, um, it becomes a very a thin ice that you're on uh, because it's uh, there's no legal reason for you to be in those records. Right, and NetCare is, um, uh, is, has very strict auditing procedures. And so the auditing procedures are something like your same name lookup. So as an optician, yes, you are correct. You technically are a custodian, although and once employed by an optometrist, you're an affiliate, but that doesn't give you any more rights to look up your own information or look up uh, information that you don't need to know. And those flags do go off like the 4th of July on net care when, uh, when people are offending or when they are looking at information that is not theirs. The optometrist will get a call, la di da di da and the investigation begins. So it's yeah, lots of fun. Yeah, and I think that, you know, this, this gives rise to a couple of things, you know. Uh, um, part of them is that, you know, the, the, the staff, if you're part of a staff of, of, of a clinic or of a a location that has a custodian, the clinic procedures must be uh, uh, um, properly documented because otherwise, if everybody's doing their own thing, there's no way of auditing that in terms of doing the right thing. So if there are no clinic procedures, if there are no standards uh, in how you've been trained to work with patients, there's a, there's a, a gap there that's an important one to know um, and one that you you should be looking to the custodian to fill. Yeah, and that's a kind of a bit of an awkward situation too, yes. because right. we've had many, many instances, not just opticians, but we've had many instances where staff are, are in a quandary because they know the PIA is not done, for example, they know the policies aren't accepted, but then where does the onus lie? And right. the the onus does lie with everyone because we're all responsible to protect health information. And it's just a matter of education, usually. Usually, and that's what we found. We, we saw this happening a lot in the dental world, where the hygienists would talk to us after we'd done some training and they'd come to us and say, listen, can you, can you help push? Because our clinic is not up to speed. Um, and, and so usually, again, it, it has really, no one's trying to skirt the rules for the most part. I think what we found is a little bit of education goes a long way. And so that's, you know, hopefully what, what you'll get today and, and, and what we're happy to do with others is just tell them what's going on about, uh, about privacy in this province. Next slide. 
Well, and, and before we leave that slide, although we can leave it because it, it does segue into this one, it but does. vendors, vendors accessing health information as an affiliate, that's illegal. But what's really been uh, dominant with the OIPC this last couple of weeks is that vendors have in their privacy yes. policy, believe it or not, that they can use information for their own purposes, let's say marketing or let's say, you know, to uh, send nice little hey, thanks for using, um, you know, our EMR or our EDR. So these examples are bad, but we'll get into it on this slide. Yeah, this is a challenge, <laughs> right? This is a challenge. I mean, the, the, the more we start to rely on technology to operate the clinic, um, and by the way, I'm, I'm an advocate of that, um, but uh, it does make sure that everybody's got to be up to speed with making sure that every one of the vendors that you're using every technology and beyond technology, you're shredding companies, the companies that are, you know, the, 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 the companies that you're engaged with to, to move around patient records, um, the billing agents, everybody has to be compliant with the same level of, of care. Um, because if you're not, it's sort of, you know, it's the, the weakest link scenario where there may be one of these guys who or one of your companies that you're working with that's just losing information. And the problem is, again, it's gonna come back to the custodian. And, and so making sure that you've got some level of assessment for these partners that the, the clinic is picking. And in addition to that, making sure that you've got the right agreements with these types of companies, whether it's someone to come in to, 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 to manage your computers, a transcriptionist, if you use those, where you're storing your records, uh, shredding companies. Again, uh, it's really important that you have very specific agreements, which kind of leads me to the next uh, slide. There's two types of agreements that you're typically going to be looking at. The first are information manager agreements. And these are, you know, broadly speaking, largely has to do with, with, with technology companies. Um, and so they store patient information, you're pulling, retrieving that information, disposing of information, all of that's usually your IT vendor or your, your medical records vendor. And so that's where uh, the first category of agreement comes in. And you'll remember from way back when, uh, uh, earlier, uh, when we talked about those third party agreements that the custodian is mandated to sign, it's actually, they need to sign these information manager agreements. And then, and then there's vendor non-disclosure agreements. And so, you know, these can be anything where there, there shouldn't be any access to health information. Like the, the, their job description or the reason you're employing them is, uh, is, is not to help you with the health information. It could be something like a cleaning company or a construction company or you know, someone who's doing the physical security, making sure there's an alarm system. All of them may incidentally come into contact with, with, with some patient information. Um, and so you need to make sure that you've got specific types of agreements for them, recognizing that when they're in your space, there is a legal agreement that they cannot share anything that they come in contact with. So those are the two agreements that, uh, 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 samples of two agreements that the custodians must have with every technology. Uh, a lot of times what we'll see is, you know, those, those agreements were made 15 years ago or 10 years ago when that clinic opened. But lots has happened in the middle. So they put in appointment, appointment management software, or they put in a new billing piece of software, or they've got a new IT company, and none of those agreements were updated. That's a challenge, and that's where really, really important to update all, all of that to maintain compliance inside the privacy, uh, inside of the HIA. Yeah, and what's important to note is the information manager agreement is mandated by the Health Information Act. Yeah. So it's not, it would be nice to have an agreement. It is you must have an information manager agreement with anyone who processes, stores, or retrieves or disposes of patient health information. Yeah, and, and by the way, it's in the custodian and the clinic's best interest to do that, um, not only because of the law, but also the information manager agreement transfers the liability to the information manager. Right, so that if the information manager makes a mistake, or if they have a privacy breach, or if they have a problem in how they're dealt with your data, the clinic isn't held responsible. It's actually that information manager, and it's this agreement that does that. Because you remember, 
the Health Information Act of Alberta puts that obligation on the custodian. So it's it's the information manager agreement that transfers that obligation now to that technical company. Next slide. Oh, compliance. So there's lots of risks uh, to patients, um, and and you know back in our history, we've been training privacy now for upwards of ten years uh, online in Canada and the U.S. And there are you know, we, we, especially in the US, we used to do webinars with individuals and, and these elements are all real. First of all, there is a, an incentive to steal data from clinics because they're worth that much more on the black market. They're worth 150 bucks a patient. And, and what that can lead to is identity theft, potentially bodily harm, definitely humiliation, loss of employment. There's lots of unfortunate cases where someone's HIV records ended up in places where they should not have, they've lost their jobs as a consequence of that, and there's all sorts of liability that follows that, including some financial loss, could be a dam damage to reputation or relationship, uh, a business or professional opportunities get lost to you because of some leak. Uh, you know, I'd say the thing that we've been really concerned about even in the past 24 months is uh, is mental health information. Uh, patients that have struggled for one re reason or another during uh, during um, uh, COVID, uh, all of a sudden, you know, they may find that there is an issue uh, with professional opportunities that are open to them if that data was leaked. So there's quite a bit of, of discussion going around that in the legal circles right now. Uh, damage, loss of property, and negative effects on credit record. All of those are risks that you may unknowingly put your patients in um, if, if in fact that data goes missing. Next slide. So, you know, what is, what is compliance? Well, the custodian, again, is responsible for the clinic, the vendors, and all your staff to make sure that that patient data is, in is protected, um, which means you have to do proper due diligence. Um, agreements, proper agreements must be signed. And there's a difference between having a secure product and having a product that meets privacy regulations. And so a level of, you know, deep level of knowledge around this is it becomes critical. And all of that has to be distilled into the privacy impact assessment, policy, training, and information manager agreements. And so there's a it's kind of a big bundle of stuff to think about there. Um, I, I personally am not uh, uh, very familiar with the uh, the uh, uh, software here, um, but making sure that they meet the security and privacy requirements is significant because once they do, then you're you're probably okay by just signing an information manager's agreement. It takes a level a level of interrogation though to make sure that that's there. Ingrid, I know you've 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 had some. <laughs> now that we've jumped to the next slide, um, uh, uh, you've had whoops, um, you've had yeah. uh, you, you've had Dealings. some interaction with with these companies. Yeah, and um, Revolution EHR definitely has now met uh, OIPC standards, as has Wink. So there, we have done some work with quite a few optometrists as well as opticians. So we do get it, and awesome. and you're right. There is a a bit of an interface, and there was a bit of a learning curve for many of them. But yeah, um, yeah we've been there. <laughs> oh, well, I, I, this is one of the favorite topics that uh, you and I uh, you and I have. All yours, collect use and dis disclosure. Yeah, so like I had kind of mentioned earlier, or maybe I did, but didn't make it clear enough. So I'll reiterate, collection, use and disclosure. So CUD, so think of that, regurgitate this information, C collection, use, disclosure, because it is the underpinnings of all privacy legislation. It's how you collect, use and disclose information, whether it be financial, personal, health, so under the Health Information Act, of course, it's collection, use, and disclosure of health or patient information. So the key to it is your policies. Do you have your policies all in place and your policies speak to how you are collecting, using, and disclosing? So for example, an administrative um, protection for collection, use, and disclosure is your passwords. Are your passwords long and strong? Are they uh, are they good enough Do or are they um, Aunt Betsy? 
for example, with no uppercase, no lowercase, no, you know. So the longer and stronger it is, the more difficult it is to crack. And I mean, I think we show that later, but um, I could be mixing up my life, which is normal too. Uh, things like, um, you know, your technical safeguards. Have you got a secure EMR? in place or a secure practice management system in place? Or have you got your physical safeguards? Is your area protected? So that's all considered in the collection use and disclosure and it's actually outlined in the privacy impact assessment. And then of course your procedures. Do you actually provide training annually as recommended by the Health Information Act, uh, which states actually periodically, but we recommend at least annually. There are so many changes ongoing that a reminder every year oh yeah or even during staff meetings you know throw in oh here's what's new in the zoo and privacy always helpful and then of course what protection and safeguards do you have in place so back to your electronic medical records or your practice management solution which is called a pms which is just perfect for me but <laughs> anyway um and then of course things that people never stop to think about but did you know fax machines have 3, 000, like thousands of patient files on? And so you turn the fax machine back in, but lo and behold, there goes all your information with it. So uh, these are things to consider when you're disclosing, that would be under, you're collecting, using and disclosing, but now you're disposing of it. And guess what happens? That fax machine now has all this information in it. And of course, make sure you disclose of personal information or health information. We had, um, there was a case where in a dumpster, 1,600 patient records. We've seen them in garages. We've seen um, when uh, a physician and a dentist, either or not, they were both not the same person, but one was in the garage, one was in the basement. And, um, you know, lo and behold, there's all these records. They didn't know what to do with them. So, you know, when they retired. So it's very important to keep this all in mind because that is actually an issue so you're collecting, using, and disclosing, but don't forget disposal. Um, compliance uh, impacting your pra practice. Um, uh, first of all, you know there are uh, financial penalties for non-compliance. Um, you'll see, you know, just a couple of examples that uh, we'll pull up here. You know, these are all pretty recent. They're all very local, and uh, as soon as you start to notice how many privacy breaches there are. It's like one of those things where once you kind of key into it, you'll see them showing up all the time in the news feeds. Um, there's a couple of take homes for this. First of all, you know, privacy beach breaches aren't planned when, and it's sort of tongue in cheek. Uh, the, the best thing we can do is plan for a privacy breach because they're rarely planned. Uh, the second is there's uh, a, a penalties for non-compliance. So you know, fines have increased. So you have to make sure that you've gone, done the right thing uh, with your clinic. Um, actions of untrained staff are the custodian's responsibility. I think training is probably the big message of the last couple of years that we've heard uh, in, uh, from the privacy commissioner, which is yeah. it's not good enough to have a privacy policy stuck on your shelf or a little poster that says we're private or we yeah. respect privacy. And, and, and I'll tell you, we've seen all of them. You know, we, we respect your patient's privacy and it's a little poster. Meanwhile, there's been absolutely no training uh, at the clinic level. And so the custodian is responsible for that. If any of you um, that are listening here um, haven't been trained at the clinic in terms of privacy, there's a gap. Um, and, and, and it's the obligation of the custodian to make sure that that gap is filled uh, to protect themselves, and, but most importantly, to protect the patients. Um, breaches do make the news and patients lose trust. We've got uh, uh, some sad examples um, where uh, we've interviewed clinics um, after they have had to make public the fact that they've lost their patient records. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the office manager that I interviewed actually ended up leaving the practice uh, because she was, for, for months later, she was dealing with the, the, the fallout of that. She was dealing with the fact that patients were angry at her and the clinic for losing their data. And they had to get now uh, a whole bunch of other uh, uh, problems solved because of it. Um, next slide. Privacy principles. Ingrid, this one's, I think this one's got your name written all over it. 
I know this is as soon as you hear the word privacy, pick me. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so basic privacy principles, and it, again, it's all privacy pretty much everywhere, is that when you collect, use and disclose, my cut, um, remember least amount of information. If you don't need to, let's say, um, you know, you have somebody come in and they disclose that they were at the dentist. Well, that's wonderful. But what they didn't disclose is that they're on all sorts of medication. That's important for you to know because it may affect the eye, it may affect the vision, it may give an impairment, temporary or permanent. So that information you need to know. So that least amount of information is if you don't need to know, you don't get the information. But if you need to know it, it's very important that you get it to do your job. A need to know basis, same, I was gonna say something rude, but same thing, different day. Uh, so it's the same thing, the le least amount of information and need to know. Uh, if you need to know the information, you deserve it. Make sure it's the least amount that you need to do your job. Uh, don't give too much information and don't give it to the neighborhood um, uh, janitorial staff or, or to anyone. This is on uh, custodian to custodian or custodian to affiliate that you need to know to do your job. Uh, highest level of anonymity. Uh, you obviously don't need to drill down to the granular if that information is not needed. Or examples like you're providing statistics um, going upstream, let's say to Alberta Health. They want to know um, how many people have uh, glasses that fit certain descriptions. Then you can provide that information, but you don't need to list every patient name unless specifically requested by a custodian. But try to keep it at the highest level of anonymity or research purposes is a really good one because they are the ones that most often, you know, want the information, but they don't need the granularity of the individual's name. Uh, according to legal authority, so this is obviously easy. So um, if the RCMP come in or city police, or if um, somebody comes to get files and says, you know, look at me in my red search, which I know they don't wear every day, but if they come in to get this information, they need to provide a subpoena court order uh, or you know the legal authority to collect that information um, things like um, a coroner uh, they would have i never say that word right but hopefully i don't need them anytime soon but if a coroner comes and asks you for some information let's say to identify a person although i can't see them coming but you never know they can quote you the legal authority that they have the right to collect this information and then of course, um, knowing when consent or notification is needing. So consent, 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 always obtain consent. It is your best protection. Um, and of course, understood or um, you know, consent that they understand that they're giving. And then notification, if you're required to notify, like your notification poster sitting at your clinic, make sure those things are in place because it's all part of the principles to ensure that you're compliant with privacy. I could have um, forgot a million things, but you know best. You know, I think you did good, and and we've added the extra D for you here, so it's kind oh. of Go well. For either it. way, it's regurgitating. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so collect only the information needed. Again, basic principles that we just went through, uh, not even two seconds ago. So, uh, for collection, try to collect it directly from the individual. Uh, so when I take my mother, God bless her, but anyway, when I take her to the physician or wherever, they should collect it directly from the individual. And I've got a few stories about things she's done to me when I've tried to provide the information because I'm trying to correct her because I know she's wrong. But anyway, you know, they have they they should collect it directly from the individual. And um, in some cases, they actually backspaced what I said until she gave her opinion. Anyway, either way, please collect directly from the individual unless authorized, authorized. So examples would be translators in some cases or, um, you know, parents of minors or mature minors. So try uh, directly from the individual and tell them, inform the individual why you're collecting that information and who may receive it. So we're not asking you every time the same patient comes back 10 times in, in a month, let's pretend. and. Um, you don't need to inform them every time of every nuance, but you do need to inform, especially the first time, we're collecting your information for the following purpose. Um, we're doing this with it. We're sending this on to Alberta Health. 
or um, we're posting it on the website, which I'm kidding, you should never do that. But <laughs> anyway, so make sure the individual is informed. And that can also be done by a poster in your clinic, which in some cases we actually see, um, as long as you understand that that isn't sufficient if the individual doesn't read the poster or even see it. Sometimes there's 2,000 up there. But um, for use, of course, you're providing a health service. Use is almost assumed. However, it is for this purpose, to provide a health service and to determine someone's eligibility. So you have the right to ask for their, PA, their health card to receive the service that you are entitled to do that because that's use of information. Um, if you're claiming it through, let's say, Blue Cross, then you have the right to ask for their information to be able to file the, the, um, you know, file the insurance claim. And then any other entities identified in the regulations, which is quite a list, so that's why we could go through it. But if you're ever curious, we can certainly provide that. And disclosure, people have the right to request access to their own information. So if they do that, make sure you have consent of the individual, which usually they do if it's their own stuff, and then make sure you maintain a disclosure log of the information that you've released. And then of course, uh, disposal, you know, there's a records retention policy. You have a certain length of time that you must can keep financial records, medical records, everything has a retention policy. And then if you're disposing it, for goodness sakes, uh, don't throw it in the garbage or in the neighborhood recycling bin. Make sure it's shredded or adequately destroyed and um, post retention period, of course. All right, well, I'm going to talk, take a couple of slides and just talk about the privacy impact assessment, which is you know, something that is, um, uh, well, let's start at the top. First of all, it's, um, it, it's, it's a document that ends up getting created, but it's, an, it's actually the process of creating that document that's probably the most valuable. Because what ends up happening is you end up reviewing, documenting your potential risks, making sure that you've got all of the confidentiality and the patient elements solved, making sure that you have the right vendors engaged, making sure you have the right agreements in place. And so, you know, not to, not to be confused, sometimes some uh, um, uh, professions feel like it's a license to practice. It's not that at all. It's also not just a document that you get someone to prepare and put onto your shelf. Um, it, it's, it's all of the policies and procedures that help you operate your clinics safely. And, and it's the process of creating those things that actually is probably one of the most valuable parts of it because um, you'll get asked questions or you'll, go, you, you'll start going down a road of asking yourself questions throughout the physical layout of the clinic, the, 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 the technical uh, safeguards that you've got. And, and you know, by going through a proper process, it'll reveal itself as to where there's problems. Next slide. Here's, here's a little, um, um, you know, just a quick sampling, and it's, it's, it's not meant for, for, for you to, 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 you know, take any notes on this. It really just is, here's an example of the type of thing that you will need to have in your privacy impact assessment. For example, I'll just pick one, wireless networking and remote access. Many waiting rooms that we're in have a guest network that's available for their patients. Well, what does that mean? What are the policies around that? Is it separated from the main network or not? What's the password policy on the customer uh, uh, or on, the, on your patient open wireless, on and on and on and on? How often do you change your passwords? What's the, regular, what's the rules around that? So that's just taking one example. But let me tell you where it comes to into play. If your clinic is breached, and it was based on the wireless networking being open. Anybody could join, and by leaving it open, they were able to hack into your personal, into your computers. Well, boy, all of a sudden, not only do you have a breach, you didn't have proper policies in place, and those policies were never reviewed by by by, by someone who knew better. So, lots and lots of policies. Here's a quick example. These things end up being a couple of hundred pages long depending on the profession, but, but really it, operates a, it offers a great guide for how to operate your clinic from a privacy and security perspective. Next slide. 
these numbers are, are you know, um, these are estimates. Uh, unfortunately, the public numbers are delayed by about a year. Is that right, Ingrid? They're about a year now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and so, yeah. so we we do kind of our best in in keeping track of some of these things. Um, we don't have a number for opticians because in most examples, opticians are working as affiliates to a custodian, and it's actually the custodian's obligation to file this. But I can tell you that you know optometrists, denturists, um, hygienists, we're seeing pretty low compliance. And we're trying to do what we can just to inform people that you know this is a challenge and they better start being careful. You can imagine when the privacy commissioner started down this road, you know, they started at the top and they're kind of working their way through. Um, dentists up until about four years ago were at about three percent of the clinics. Um, and and so they've jumped, you know, they've 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 made it part of their you know, part of their credo to 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 keep talking about privacy and getting their clinics engaged. And and, and, and. next slide. But it is it is a bit concerning when you see those kind of numbers because it, it tells is. you that when I go see my optometrist or optician, then I want to make sure that they're compliant. It's just that yeah. level of comfort going in, knowing yeah. that okay, they've done their due diligence. I don't have to worry about my information being splattered everywhere. It's true. It's, it's, and mine's it's, one of those two percent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Ingrid, tell us about the NetCare PIA because there's been so much confusion, not surprisingly, because one's called a privacy impact assessment and the other one's called the NetCare privacy impact, uh, impact assessment. So no wonder there is a confusion around this by most of the professions we talk to, but why don't you take us through this? Yeah, so um, I I was the uh, privacy lead for NetCare for many years. It was more fun than a barrel of monkeys. But what had happened is initially the NetCare PIA was encompassed in your clinical PIA. It started to be separated out and a standalone expedited NetCare PIA because the turnaround for NetCare was needed to be immediate. So yeah. as a result, they started saying, well, they're built into our other PIA our regular PIA, and then of course, a year and a half later, they're like, oh gee, I wonder if there's a problem. Or, you know, it was just problematic, obviously. The privacy commissioner decided that we need to separate this out, and that is what's happened. What we have unfortunately seen is that a lot of people, um, not just optometrists, not just um, chiros, not just dentists, not just physicians, they went down the path of, all right, I got a PIA, even though it was only the expedited neck care PIA. So the expedited neck care PIA is 10 pages or so long, and all it speaks to is that you've got an established uh, prime, uh, PMS, uh, management system, practice management system, or an EMR or an EDR, whatever. You've got an accepted one, that's great, but your NetCare PIA speaks to how it's interfacing with NetCare only. The policies do not speak to your clinic. The nothing actually speaks to your clinic itself. It's a pre-accepted NetCare expedited PIA that the actually the provincial government has almost written on your behalf. And they've done their due diligence on their end. So if you've written a NetCare PIA, hip hip hooray, I'm thrilled. But now you know what is needed for the next step, and that's yeah. your actual clinical PIA. And a good, a good example is if you look at that list of policies that we reviewed, none of those are covered in a NetCare PIA because it's not specific to NetCare. And so that's why there's there's unfortunately a confusion. They should have called it something other than a PIA, like a NetCare addendum, maybe would have been more appropriate, because or a NetCare appendix or a next NetCare you know, add-on. Because that would have been more appropriate in the in in the vernacular of, of of how people recognize it, but unfortunately there is confusion. We have to deal with it. We talk to lots of clinics every day who feel they're good, but actually are nowhere close because they don't have a proper PIA. Yeah, and and the truth is you could have ten PIAs. So an example will be in a, a physician office that maybe is hooked to a primary care network. Well, they have a PIA for that. Right. And then they've got a PIA for any interface they may have with Connect Care at Alberta Health Services. They may have one for CII, which is Community Integration, 
initiative. They may have a separate one for that. So yeah. in some cases, we've seen clinics with as many as 10 PIAs. So, and neck air is just one of the 10. So again, um, not trying to scare you, but that's, well, maybe I am. No, I'm just kidding, I'm not. <laughs> but, but so, I mean, we're lucky as opticians and optometrists that we actually will have um, primarily the two, the actual practice PIA and your neck care PIA. Um, uh, I think the next slide here that's coming up uh, is on breaches. Ingrid, why don't you take the next three slides? I think uh, they're all around the breach and, and you, you are, uh, um, you're seeing yeah, these I, things day to day. And so I'll, it's just better to, to, let, to let you roll through this. And then I'll take the next section, which is about cyber threats. Oh, well, I, well, yeah, I actually like breaches better. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, so a, a breach. So if you've ever had one, I'm sorry for you, but um, yeah, they're not pretty for sure. But what is a breach? Well, a breach could be as simple as or as complex as the loss, unauthorized access to, or unlawful disclosure of individually identifying information. So it could be under PIPA, as we discussed, or it could be under the Health Information Act. Either way, mandatory reporting. So it is um, things like unauthorized access to, or collection of, or use, or disclosure, our favorite cut or disposal of personal information or health information. So a breach actually, you know, it, it's it's almost anything <laughs> that that is illegal or anything that you could um, you know if you snoop that's a breach if you accidentally or intentionally dispose of information because oh well we don't we want to pretend we didn't see that that again is a breach and the biggest thing is what is the risk of harm to the individual who's subject of the loss so, or unauthorized access or disclosure. So what happens is there's an actual risk mitigation that you have to do and see what the risk is, how you mitigated it, because a lot of times the risk of harm to an individual that you, you may determine to be small is actually huge. It could be identity theft, it could be anything. So that risk of harm is equally to consider under the Health Information Act and under PIPA. You know, the, I told you, I was trying to keep quiet, <laughs> but, but. But, but you know, this risk of harm, again, when we look at the legislation, it's a really interesting part of the HIA because we're kind of, the, the act basically suggests that the custodian needs to analyze how big is the risk of harm. And I can tell you, it's, it's pretty hard for, for privacy professionals to come up with risk of harm analysis. But boy, when you put that in the hands of a custodian, in most examples that we've seen, the risk of harm is considerably more than the custodian might think because they don't they don't have it through a proper system. So, uh, really important uh, uh, to note as as people are identifying whether or not their clinics um, are breached. Next slide. It's a good thing you chimed in. I would agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this time I'm going to stay quiet. Uh, I know you better. Um, so I have so many examples of breaches and if I only had time, but um, the most common is actually loss of patient information, whether it's misplaced laptop because one stolen every, uh, I think it's something like a thousand a day. I don't even remember the number, yeah. but misplaced laptop or stolen. Um, you know, the front of the pickup isn't a good place for your laptop, especially if you have patient information on. Um, or a hard drive stolen, or or the USB sticks. I've seen them go missing like no tomorrow. And the surprising how many still use them for transferring health information. Um, cell phone. How many people have actually the information sitting on their cell phone? Again, they go missing all the time. I'm not telling you how many times I've lost mine, but it's all encrypted, no health information, la di da di da. But lots of personal information. So again, happens all the time huge example of a breach. Um, unauthorized access to, yeah, again, snooping, number one comes to mind, to medical, chiro, optometry. Uh, the biggest breaches right now are sitting in the medical and the chiro industry. Uh, notwithstanding that, those are the ones that are maybe more often reported. Uh, snooping, collecting unnecessary information, um, you know, uh, I, all those things come into mind. 
inappropriate storage. There's that USB sticks, boxes in the garage. We could tell you horror stories of that. We even knew a, a doc that passed away with all sorts of, all his patient records were sitting in the house. And his poor wife, bad enough she already lost someone, but now she's looking at all these medical records. She wasn't snooping, but she found all these boxes of medical records and like, now what? Now what? And so what about all these patients? How do you think they felt to find out that not only had the dog passed away, but nobody could find their records? <laughs> well, we know where they were, they were in the garage. But anyway, <laughs> notwithstanding that, and then disclosure of patient information, right? Like gossiping. At the front counter, we've I, we've gone in for surprise audits into clinics and the information that they're talking about at the front counter. Oh, did you see the size of that uh, wart on his back end? Or did you see that, you know? And they name patients or they say, oh, did, did you see that guy that just left? That was Fred, you know, he's got an ad that, like that information at the front counter, that's still breach because you can't disclose that information. And that's also why you have some music playing in the background. So hopefully nobody hears either which way, not good. Misdirected fax or email, the key to secure email, for example, is that that is a preventable breach. Same as misdirected fax, like fax, it should be gone by way of the dodo, but um, you know, they're still hanging on for dear life. But we have misdirected faxes almost hourly. We get a call about, oh, oh, what about this? Or, oh my, I think I sent it to the wrong place. Or, oh, it went to the Calgary Herald. Now what do I do? So it happens all the time and there's prevention for it, but either which way, don't use it is what I'm saying. Uh, information technology, your specialty here, hacking, cybercrime, or no safeguards or insufficient safeguards or no information manager agreement in place. So not only are you violating the law there, you don't know what your information manager is doing with your information, if they're safeguarding it, if it's protected. You don't know any of these things if you don't have an agreement with them that meets the law. No, you didn't say a word. I can't believe it. I know. I, I'm trying. I, Jeff just messaged me and said, we're running out of time. Talk faster. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> okay. I'll talk faster. So, and then how to manage a breach? Well, it's contain, assess, notify and mitigate uh truth be told the easiest thing to do is try and stop the bleed right away or the contain the breach but the you know what call us because we deal with it all the time it's a lot easier for us to help walk you through than for you to try and manage this on your own and end up in more hot water great all right let's talk a little bit about the, the thanks great um let's talk a little bit about cyber threats uh and and what to do with those. Now, again, we're we're running a little bit short of time here, and we want to make sure we leave some time for you to be able to ask questions. So let's jump to the next slide. I've got some examples of, of ransomware, and you know, uh, you you may have already heard of ransomware, but think about it like this: um, someone in, in your office has clicked on a link, and when they clicked on the link, all of the computers in your office got locked down. And until you pay the ransom, until the person who owns the office pays the ransom, uh, that information is locked away. Now, um, we know that most of these uh, uh, ransomware attacks happen through email. We know of over a dozen in Alberta in different types of clinics. And we also know that the, the typical ransom is between three and $10,000 in Alberta. We also know of one that paid over 60. We also know of one uh, a clinic in a rural community that um, that ended up uh, uh, going out of business because they lost 95% of the data. There is massive, massive information around this stuff. It is um, absolutely a professional uh, um, uh, attack. These aren't hackers eating pizza and drinking Coke, this is their day job. And their day job is to get better at it. Billions of dollars have been, have been paid in ransom and millions of records have been compromised. And like I said, this is not something that's someone else's problem. We know many clinics in Alberta that have had ransomware and, and struggle to recover from it. 
All right, Jeff, let's keep going here. Um, 92% are initiated with email. And what I'm going to spend a little bit of time on now is just showing, showing you some examples and how easy it is to be caught by these things. Um, and so, so here's one, and we call this section anatomy of an attack. And there's various varieties of these. Um, I probably get a couple a week, um, as do many of you. We haven't yet updated these deck, this deck to show all the mobile ones that are now coming, because typically people don't have a lot of mobile patient records. Uh, so it's a little bit safe, except if you're using your mobile network, your mobile device, on your corporate network. Now it'll jump from your mobile device or someone else's in your office into your computer network, onto your computers and start taking over the computers. So here's one. And um, uh, first of all, they usually come from a trusted organization. These are the, are the most successful. And there's a great offer. So for me, those of you who, who might know me, a refund is something that gets my attention because it's money back in my pocket. And so I'm always clicking on these things. Um, uh, there's a, usually a, a familiar feature or a credibility feature. So for example, the reference code 2550CGE, no one could have made that up ever. It looks too legitimate. And then all they're saying is, hey, update your address so that we can send you money. That's the way I read it because it was double charged. So it all sounds legit and the offer is enticing. As soon as you click on that link, your computer network will be locked up, all of the computers will be, and uh, the, you'll, be, you'll have to pay a ransom to get your data back or take one of the other strategies. This one, this one now is you know, uh, a little bit old, um, but you know, what are the clues around this one? Um, so the first is that, uh, first of all, I don't recognize 807-241, so why would I open this? Okay, well, that seems a bit weird. Um, secondly, you know, the company like eFax, there is a company called eFax, they'd never send an email that was kind of malformed, and so open brackets and coding language. Um, the other is, you know, if you look at the, the link, to view your facts in Microsoft Word. So you can see they're playing on the fact that I know Microsoft Word, and yeah, I'd like to use that to open my facts. Um, but then you read the URL. If you read that, it's clearly not going to anything that I would know. And so, and then it says, if you require help, click on this, and that one is a legitimate one. So they've really mixed it up. But people typically think facts is secure, and by, by extension, eFax must also be secured, not so. Next slide. Um, this is just you know, one of the ones I like to include because there's a wide variation in the type of social engineering that will affect or that will uh, draw people in. Uh, and by, by people, I mean your staff, uh, people that you work with. So you know, this is, uh, I have a $749 charge on my card from your company. Here's my credit card statement. Please cross it with your data and let me know what it is. I want to connect before connect you before I call the authorities. Listen, as a small business owner, this stuff gets my attention because the title fraudulent credit card charge from your company, it's like, oh no. So as soon as this document's opened up, it's called, it's a Word document. It looks like a Word document. As soon as it opens up, again, all of your network gets locked up and now you're held ransom to pay someone else for that. Next slide. Um, so, uh, so all that to say, quick summary. Um, you know, we, we we used to do an hour-long seminar where we just go through examples and examples and examples. Jeff, maybe to note, uh, we should probably do that again. I think uh, we kind of lost our pace on that during uh, COVID. Although I suspect many more ransomware attacks occurred. Uh, so maybe it's time to to update that and do another hour long. Let us know if you're interested in that write a comment uh, or, or send us a note and we'll, we'll make sure that you get invited to that. Um, this is uh, uh, Clinic Safeguards, um, Ingrid, uh, your department. Yeah, no, this is a true story. And I just wanted to say Apple's another one that's uh, very famous for being copied because that's the one my mother yeah. got caught at. Really and um, it took months 
to cancel all our credit cards, get everything oh, yeah. back in order. So Lord Almighty, don't go down this road. It's not pretty. Um, but this, this is something we can control. So my favorite uh, for safeguards is the expression apt. You're apt to be safe. You're also apt to remember apt because that's to me makes the most sense, but administrative, physical and technical safeguard. So under your administrative, of course, is, is I call it the paperwork part of the safeguards. So administrative is like people, like how your policies around computers, your uh, telecom, telecommunication, if people still use phone, even I still do, uh, verbal, patient charts, all that fit under your administrative safeguards. Your physical, on the other hand, is your physical surrounding. So look at things like don't use, uh, don't be in Starbucks uh, using their free Wi-Fi because A, the physical surrounding is dangerous, but again, their technical is not worth anything. Um, locked filing cabinets, again, your physical safeguard. Make sure your access to your storage areas or your server is actually just that. Keep it accessible to staff, not to every Tom, Dick and Harry that comes into your clinic. And then follow your retention period guidelines because from a physical perspective, the more records that you have post or past your retention period just opens up, uh, you know, a can of worms that you really don't need to be in. It just increases your liability and your risk. Technical, on the other hand, is anything to do with your EMR, your PMS, I love that saying, and your IT. So your network access, your information controls, like who can access your system, and then your information system activity reports, your audit logs, which you're expected or mandated actually to check, that falls under your technical safeguards. So now you're apt to remember this, easy breezy cover girl. And quick, I could be quicker, but. <laughs> oh, this, I love it, is this you or me? But anyway, cracking your password, that long and strong expression, it's here for a reason. Because if you have a three character Tom, as your password, well, guess what? It's if it's only numbers, one, two, three, very common. And my grandson's was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Well, that could be cracked in a heartbeat. But anyway, now you know his password. <laughs> He's changed it, by the way. <laughs> but this is just a very good example of if it's long, let's say 16, 17 characters, and you have numbers, uppercase, lowercase, the likelihood of cracking it is 193. I don't know what TN stands for time in years anyway so it takes it takes time so it's not easy breezy unless of course you tell someone the password then <laughs> then it's really quick to crack it it's uh it's good for your business you know i think that um as we, as we look at the hia and the increasing fine the fines that are occurring we know that there's more legislation now that's coming that's going to in fact increase these fines even further um, it's good business, first of all, um, just to do it, uh, to make sure that not only are you protecting your patient uh, uh, information, but you're actually protecting your practice. Um, the Health Information Act, the fine of not less than $200,000 to take reasonable steps to protect against reasonably anticipated threats. Everything that we've talked about today is a reasonably anticipated threat. Uh, I don't know a lot of businesses that could manage a fine of two hundred thousand dollars or more um, that are you know in in our world it just is not it's it's not the type of extra cash people have sitting around and if you did you wouldn't want to spend it on a fine. Um, the, the privacy, do a PIA. Yeah, versus doing a PIA exactly <laughs> and training your staff. Um, uh, the, as a, as a uh, the privacy impact assessment in the process of doing it, you analyze the threats to the clinic. And so you actually get, there's a lot of value in doing that because you get better informed about what's happening in your clinic with your policies. Um, making sure that you've got policies and procedures mitigate that liability. You make sure that not only do you have proper policies, but that you're training on them. Um, average cost of recovery is almost $2 million. Um, that's in a larger firm. What we've typically seen is about $200 per patient record is a good way of estimating what it's going to cost to recover uh, from a breach. Add that to the ransomware. Um, only 8% of companies that even pay the ransom get the data back. So this is an example where one of the ones that we uh, communicated with, one of the clinics that we know of, 
Um, they got they got uh, hit by ransomware, paid the ransom, didn't get their data back, lost 95% of all patient records. Uh, mandatory breach reporting forces clinics uh, like yours to, to tell patients when their information is mishandled or lost. And you can imagine the reputational damage that follows that. Um, patients expect privacy. That's becoming something that I would say in my career in privacy over the last 15 years, uh, more and more and more is becoming an expectation that the patients have rather than a nice to have. It's actually, you know, we've got some clinics now that are that are very clear about their policies and using it, using that as, a, as, as an advantage to work with them. Next slide. Um, there are changes. Um, uh, Ingrid, you're, you're, you're more up on these changes than I am, so why don't you take the slide? Yeah, so the biggest thing with um, the introduction of Bill 46 last December, just a few months ago, I, oh no, it's almost a year now. So uh, the Alberta government, in their infinite wisdom, introduced changes to legislation. Oh, I guess I couldn't have said, shouldn't have said that in the middle. So Bill 46 was not just the splitting of the colleges and association, which did affect some, for sure. The biggest thing is the increase in breach fines. Yeah. So, um, for example, a breach now could be up to $1 million for a business. And I don't know anybody that can afford that. Well, I can't, but um, but the what, what mitigates that? Well, if you have a PIA in place and you have an IMA to insist in the compliance, that's huge. So, A, it would also reduce, most likely reduce your fine because they would say you've taken the necessary steps and you've done your due diligence, that's beneficial. And of course, to make sure your safeguards in place and you're apt to remember the safeguards that need to be in place to protect your health information. And I saw Jeff come on, which means? <laughs> My turn. <time. laughs> yeah, so thanks so much for taking everybody through that. Um, hopefully it was helpful. Um, we will be following up and, and um, you know, I think we did get a question here about the recording. We will send this out to everybody who was registered before we leave today, before we get into the questions. Um, I just want to point out that we have a number of other resources you can go through. Um, we do have a nine episode podcast you can access through our website or you can go to protectyourpractice.brightsquid.com um, and then you can listen to all those episodes. Um, in those, we do analysis of actual breaches at clinics that were reported. Clinics or healthcare organizations talk about what the implications are and how those should have been avoided. Um, we also have a number of privacy-themed webinars beyond uh, beyond this one um, that deal with different specific topics. Um, you can find those on the website as well underneath the privacy consulting tab. Uh, there's a, a button there called privacy webinars and you can click on that and there's a number of recordings you can check out at your leisure um, we also have a number of other resources we will send these out so we have a little checklist that we send to the clinics that we work with um, so we talked about assessing risk of harm and in, in the event of a breach um, this is sort of a, a sort of a good framework to go through when you when the breach happens and you want to decide if there is a risk of harm or try to figure that out, we'll send you that. As well as privacy officer duties, so every clinic is mandated to have a privacy officer. You have somebody in charge of that. Um, and that's one of the custodian duties is making sure there's somebody in charge. Um, so there's a list of sort of things that privacy officers should be doing on a regular basis. We will send that out as well. Um, we also have a privacy risk assessment checklist. It's sort of a starter package for um, getting getting privacy compliance on the go at your clinic. Um, so we'll send that out as well. It's, it's a series of check boxes you can go through. It's about four pages long. It's almost like a, a light privacy questionnaire for your clinic to see uh, where any gaps are to start with. Um, so thank you very much. We do have a number of questions. Um, so I want to take a look at those. Um, this is a good one. What happens if your head office is outside of Canada? Do they still have to inform or train employees? Or is it just businesses that are located in Alberta that, that fall under the HIA? Uh, Ingrid, no, you know. yeah. So it's a catch-22 because I would say over half of the um, clinics or companies um, actually have head office in U.S. or in Europe. So there is separate legislation, obviously HIPAA in the U.S. and GDPR in Europe. But the bottom line does is no matter what happens in Alberta, you must comply with Alberta legislations. So we've had many companies in the US that have actually complied for their clinics by writing a PIA on behalf of their clinics. 
So no matter what, sad but true, you're practicing in Alberta, you must have a PIA. And it goes right to the technologies that you use. You have to make sure that if, for example, if one of your technologies stores data in the US as opposed to storing it in Canada, it's a no-no. And so, yeah, there's lots of, it doesn't matter where head office is, if they're operating in Alberta or in Canada, you absolutely have to comply with the legislation of the land. Yeah. Um, next question. Are we legally legally allowed to record a ULI that has been provided verbally by the patient on the phone or in person, or do we have to see the card? What's a ULI? A PHI, um, like personal health information card? Or a PHC? I, I think so. Provincial health card? Uh, um, if you receive the number over the phone, that that is considered information that you've received and that is inf health information you are allowed to collect it um, verification of identity would be helpful prior to doing that and uh, assuming you're using it for the purpose it's intended which is to bill or provide a service that is acceptable yeah great. but you're the I lawyer so <laughs> only play one on this webinar <laughs> <laughs> um, the next question we have then is uh, this is actually kind of two parts. Where where do breaches get reported, and what is an affiliate responsibility to report a breach? So breaches are mandated to be reported to the Minister of Health, to the Office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner, and to all affected individuals. Prior to doing that, you need to do a risk of harm to determine the level of risk of harm. Um, uh, so all of that is outlined in our information on breaches, as well as on the OIPC website. There is a link to how to report a breach. Um, the second part of that one was, uh, what's the obligation of the affiliate to report a breach? Um, the obligation, strictly speaking, the obligation of the affiliate is to bring it to the attention of the custodian. Um, the custodian is the one that's legally responsible to report it, uh, assess the risk of harm. Uh, so the affiliate's responsibility is with that. However, I would say if there are concerns that nothing is dealt with at that point, that you would raise it within your own association as a concern. Um, because, you know, you want to, I would say, uh, you want to be in a position where you have done your level best, recognizing that your employment, it may be dependent on working for that custodian, you wanna make sure that you've done your level best so that nothing ever does come back to you, uh, whether it be the custodian denying that they've done this, that they that they uh, have done the wrong thing, or them trying to blame you, in fact, for a breach. I think it's uh, super important to be, you know, above ground on this one. And document. And document. Yeah, they'll have that paper trail, for sure. Um, if, if a patient requests, uh, information such as a receipt or something over the phone or email is it okay or do they need to come in there's a lot to this question actually yeah it's big it's it's a borderline question so they can certainly request a receipt over the phone or do any of that but the actual pickup you would need uh, consent to release unless you can verify the identity because yeah. i just wouldn't be handing um uh, let's say my ex-husband went in to go get a receipt on my stuff or on the kids stuff on you know it, there's so many liabilities that are involved with that that I would definitely consent of the individual as well as you know verify the identity when they come in yeah and there's going to be some of that even depends on you know what's cons what's on the receipt um, you know depending on uh, what what level of treatment information uh, is going to be disclosed there? Um, that would all be really part of the question and assessed in the risk of harm um, if there's in fact a breach. So um, the easy answer is uh, don't, but I'm not sure that's the practical answer. I think the practical answer would be, as Ingrid said, you know, make sure that you have consent. And if you're planning to do this, or if this is a regular uh, event, make sure you get that consent when they come in. Um, if specifically in rural parts of the uh, of this province, if a patient isn't planning to get that, isn't planning to come in again, make sure you get the consent up front 
with their written permission to get that information sent to them when and if they need it. Right, and it depends because the uh, other part of the question was in regards to email. Well, you can yeah. email anything out that has health information no, or, no. and I would be very cautious with even financial email yeah. or financial information, unless of course it's secure or yeah. and, and not or, but and you have consent yeah. because they have to be aware of the risks of sending via email. And so please don't send uh, by hotmail or by something loosey goosey. Uh, as I was going to actually say that, you know, I think it's it's important when we talk about sending information by email that we talk about not doing that. And yeah. you know, even when we talk about consent, the keyword is informed consent. So that list of risk uh, that that we showed for patients if their information gets up, going through all of those risks and what they mean, that's informed consent. Okay. Going through, we're going to a patient saying using email might be risky. Are you okay with that? That's not informed consent. Uh, so you actually have to go through, and probably by the time you get to four or five on that list, the patients are gonna say, yeah, let's do something else, right? So, so um, I, and I've, I've had that conversation with clinics um, who have since changed their policies, right? Because, because it, it, it got to be common practice, and it's starting to go away a little bit now, so that's, that's good. Um, we have a couple questions, we have only a couple minutes. One quick question I want to address um, is how to submit this webinar for, for learning credit, um, that is a question for, for, the, for the college. Um, we, we didn't get into that when we were asked to do this presentation, unfortunately, so, so, um, so we don't have that information. Um, the last question we'll talk about here, and this is, this is sort of a regulatory issue, so I'm not entirely sure if we'll have the right answer here for this, um, but, uh, but we have either single license or dual license auditions in Alberta, um, if a, so Sorry, did you have to cut out there for a sec? Single, single or dual? Okay. Single or dual license. So, oh, it's, uh, eyeglass dispenser is a single license. That's a, that's a certain kind of license. Um, and would would somebody with that be okay with looking at um, like a contact lens practitioner record, like some other record for for a different licensed professional? Uh, how does that fit under privacy regulations if they're not licensed? To, to deal with that, that information. But it's almost irrelevant if they're licensed. And an example would be a dentist would have the right to look at a medication that a pharmacist or a physician uh, dispensed if it had if it had a direct impact on the patient that they were treating. So you are allowed to look up the information on the patient that's relevant. And that's irrespective of which college they belong to. Yeah. And, and in and regards to the CME credits, if you're providing a certificate, I would have to say that logic is that if the association uh, recognizes that, then they give the credits. But yeah, um, and then yeah, well, let's say back, you know, back to that question of is the information you're accessing required to do your to do your job? If you're just looking at the the records for for interest sake, then you know we come back to the privacy principles of of yeah. make sure you're accessing the information you need to do your job only. Uh, that brings us to our time. I don't have any more questions. We had some great ones today. That was actually really good. Um, thank you everyone for your participation. Thank you for giving us your time today. Um, hopefully it was helpful. Like I said, we will send out a recording. We'll send out a few other documents and checklists that we showed you. Please, you know, if you want to dig into this deeper, look into the, the webinars, the podcast that we've done. Um, if you have any questions, you can get in touch with our team. Um, and, uh, and Ingrid and Rowan, thank you so much again for, for your, your insights and, um, and your taking us through this today. So Thanks, uh, with everybody. that, uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend, everyone, and uh, we'll talk soon. Bye, everyone. Yeah, thank you. It was fun.